The most talented, the most important, the greatest of all time. Who is the GOAT movie director? Spielberg, Hitchcock, Orson Welles, Alice Guy, Christopher Nolan, or... Wait, 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 wait. Alice who? That's right. For your consideration, Alice Guy Blanchet, the greatest film director of all time. We love Steven, Al, and both Daves, and so many others that could be in the GOAT debate. But we propose someone who nearly disappeared from the annals of cinematic history, despite being arguably the first cinematic storyteller. Repeat, the first cinematic storyteller. She wrote and directed what many consider to be the first fictional narrative film, and she did it in the 1800s, over 120 years ago. This person is the George Washington to your Abraham Lincoln, the Alan Turing to your Steve Jobs, the godfather of your godfather part two. She is Alice Guy, a.k.a. Alice Guy Blanchet. She directed about 1,000, that is not a typo, 1,000 movies in her short 26-year directing career, including 22 feature films. As of the writing of this video, Spielberg has completed 34 feature films, but in a period nearly twice as long as Guy's. Spielberg also produces and founded Amblin Entertainment, turning his directing skills into a media brand owned and operated by him. So did Guy. She founded the successful Solex Studio in 1910. That's 1910 in America. Seven years before women were even allowed to vote. But can you compare achievements of a modern director like Spielberg to Guy's achievements from over a hundred some odd years ago? Look. You're right, we'll never see a prime Jack Nicklaus versus a prime Tiger Woods, nor a Michael versus a LeBron, but you can view Alice Guy's Falling Leaves next to Jurassic Park. Eh, it doesn't seem like a fair fight, does it? So are newer movies better? Well, yeah, in many ways they are, and they should be, shouldn't they? Look at AFI's number one movie of all time, Citizen Kane, versus the most recent Marvel's Infinity War, which has more ratings on IMDb and a higher overall rating already. So as much as we'd like to see Sam Langford duke it out with Sugar Ray Robinson, any good GOAT debate must compare achievements to their contemporaries. We must compare the power of stories and technical innovations to their own times. With Alice Guy Blanchet, you get both innovation of story and technology. She's basically the James Cameron of her time. She made movies with color, Pirates Escapade in 1900. She made short musicals with sound called phono scenes, like this one from 1906. These phono scenes work like modern day looping, also known as ADR, where actors recorded their dialogue and songs by lip sync matching in post production. The patent belonged to Leon Gamont, as in Gamont Studios, where Alice Guy worked and wanted the phono scenes for her pioneer films. She was making the very first of these with the guy who owned the innovation. There's her work, like The Burglars from 1897, that predates the madcap comedies of the Marx Brothers, Three Stooges, Benny Hill, or every hallway scene from Scooby Doo. We only have an incomplete version of it, but it's a complex theatrical set, blocked in stage so that the police and burglars pop in and out all over the set as the heist goes awry. Then there's her movies with special effects, advanced lighting, location shoots, hundreds of extras, and over two dozen sets like in her early masterpiece, V Decreased, where her use of depth and staging were groundbreaking. And keep in mind, what you're seeing are films that have been degraded for a century. They didn't look like this to their first audiences. They were in HD, right? It's film. Yet, we can see how innovative they were. She saw into the future when it came to working with actors, too. Her slogan in the studio was, be natural, regarding actors' performances. All this happened decades before method acting became popular, decades before Dorothy stepped into a colorful Oz, or even decades before the jazz singer sang. But let's put all this aside and remember that she filmed her first fiction film in 1896. Only the Lumiere brothers could argue they'd done it first, but that was called The Waterer Watered, starring the Lumiere brothers' actual gardener, and in the movie he is, well, a gardener. It's a great funny scene, and we're not discounting it, but Guy's movie was pure fiction, staged with a set and actors, and done in 1896. It's called The Cabbage Fairy. It may not seem like much, only 50 seconds in a single shot, and it's a little weird. It's hard to imagine the pitch between Guy and Gaumont. What does she do with the babies after she plucks them from the garden? 
Oh, she plops them on the ground like any other vegetable. Right, right, and we'll use real babies. Of course. Her later films are more advanced, of course, but this YouTube-style film lit the fuse that put cinematic storytelling on a rocket's trajectory. This trajectory, this steep curve, led to D.W. Griffith and Fritz Lang and Coppola and Tarkovsky at both Andersons and everyone. On top of all of this, while her famous contemporaries like Melier were making movies like Trip to the Moon, where a bunch of white guys travel to a distant land, beat up the natives, capture a couple, bring them back home in chains to parade them around as entertainment while they throw a big party for themselves. Sound familiar? Guy was working for women's suffrage and made the first film with an all-black cast called A Fool and His Money. In the movie, a poor black man falls in love with a sophisticated, wealthy black woman. Not exactly Griffith's portrayal of African Americans in Birth of a Nation. It's a comedy and the poor lad ends up losing out, but the performances are both as hammy and serious as white cast contemporary films. While we see black cast members in other movies around this time and later, they're typically stereotyped and put into servile roles. Outside of Guy's work, it's not until 1919 that Oscar Michaud's film Homesteader paves the way forward, and his story in cinema history is unfortunately similar to Guy's. There's also Algy the Minor, where queer cinema makes an early cameo, and The Little Rangers, which is a pro-feminist movie, as the Brooklyn Academy of Music describes it. A quick IMDb scan of her feature-length films is like shuffling through great logline pitches. The Great Adventure, for example, was a commercial success. While it was not critically well-received, that's not much of a surprise, since the main character is a woman seeking success on Broadway. And this is the battle both she and her films were constantly waging. Why should a bunch of male critics in male-dominant society make any difference on how the quality of her films are perceived? Received. One of our modern female filmmaker heroes explains it well here. If there's not a person in the room who gets it, then you'd be like, oh, she doesn't get anything on. And it just perpetuates mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. And that's why I feel like the more diverse the room in every way, the smoother sailing. People behave themselves better. Different things, the cream will rise differently, you know. Essentially, without diverse voices in every aspect of the filmmaking industry, we all lose out on great content. Like Guy's female protagonist films, Barbara Frienchi, House of Cards, Stronger Than Death, and others, or what almost happened to Tina Fey's Kotex classic. Innovative technology? Check. Innovative technique? Check. Innovative storytelling? Check. Drama, comedy, frontline artistic social activism? Check. 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 Unfortunately, as companies merged and grew into the likes of MGM, Paramount, RKO, and others, numerous female filmmakers were displaced from their pioneering days. Even Gaumont, the oldest film company still in existence in the world, originally left Guy out of their 1930 publication of the company's history, despite her having worked there for over a decade and conceiving of and founding their theatrical film department. Even the Lumiere brothers, the founders of cinema, did not see the medium's future. Guy was there in 1895 when the brothers exhibited their first films. She saw their films, she saw their potential, and acted on it earlier than any other filmmaker. And when the brothers abandoned what they thought was a novelty, Alice Guy pioneered the future of film, a future she was largely and unjustly cut out of. After World War I and her divorce helped force her out of the industry, she returned to France where a similarly changed industry would not let her back in. Largely with the help of her daughter Simone, her rightful place in history began to be restored. At least in France, she received some recognition before her death, the Legion of Honor, France's highest civilian honor. In America, there's a growing number of documentaries, and she's now in the New Jersey Hall of Fame, but there's still work left to be done. We hope her rightful place will continue its deserved rise, and if you have a box of very old films in your attic, or know someone who has, or work in your film archives, double check your stock. You might be able to reintroduce the world to a lost work made by one of the most forward-thinking, greatest of all time directors. What do you think of Alice Guy Blanchet's work? Who's your favorite director of all time? Let us know in the comments. This is Gamma Ray. Make sure to like, subscribe, comment, hit that notification bell, do all the things. We will see you next time.